Jeff, thank you for joining me. Appreciate your time, man. Hey, it's great to be here, Victor. Thanks for having hey, me. By the way, for those of you who don't, don't know who Jeff Kozer is, let me tell you how I met this guy. Well, I'm meeting you for the first time, but let me tell you how I came across your book. I remember seeing your book, and I was like, the audacity of this individual when I read your – the first I saw selling to zebras, I'm like, oh, what does that mean? And then it was like, how to close 90% of your business. I'm like, my brain and me say, what the – you know, what do you mean close 90% of your business? Let me go get this book because anybody who's that cocky – must have something to offer. So again, you know, welcome to the program. There it is, man. It's so, you know, explain to people who have not read your book, which I highly recommend. I highly recommend because as I was going through the book, I'm like, oh, this is so obvious, right? And you just laid it out. Talk about selling to zebras and then we're going to talk about your new venture. So a zebra is your perfect prospect. And what you do is you start with what does a perfect customer look like? And we, we split it into seven attributes and, and it's, it's, it's actually very simple. Um, and when, once you do it, um, it takes some work, but once you do it, everybody says, you know, we knew all those things about our best customers, but we never put them down. And then you, then you measure all your other prospects against those seven attributes. And what starts to happen is where you are with your deal starts to pop out. And it, it, it actually tells you pretty much when you've earned the right to ask for the business, which is why you end up closing. You, you really do close nine out of 10 that end up becoming green once you score them. You know, and it's interesting because, you know, you know, I hear salespeople talk about this, that find your ideal client profile, your zebra. I've always loved that phrase. I, you just nailed it with that phrase. I, that was just such a visual because when I, when I, to this day, since I've read your book, what year did your book come out? 2008. And so when I remember I read it, I think it was like 2009, like a year later or something. So since actually, then- Actually, technically 2009 was published. Okay. And, and I remember see, hearing zebra. That every, every time somebody said ideal client profile, oh, you mean a zebra? You know, that, I started using your vernacular. And so it's interesting how you said, if you just look at enough of your history, mm -hmm. if you have some history with your customers, you begin to find or see these zebras. That's right. What are some of the attributes, just one or two attributes before we talk about your new ventures, like one or two things you've discovered that people have a hard time with in terms of identifying their zebra? You know, what are some of the mental roadblocks? Well, we, so, so there's seven and they're actually in strategic order. So it's not just random seven. It's, <laughs> so the first one is company and that's sort of the, the demographic stuff. You know, what industries do you do well in? Um, what are their size? maybe region of the country or the region of the world. Um, and then we, we like to dive into what the culture of that company is that makes it fit with the culture of your company. And that's a little bit tougher. Um, and, and the process helps you figure that out. Um, and then the second one is, is operations. And operations gets into what type of business problems do you solve for your clients that create value? Mm -hmm. And then what do your customers say is that value? So you, you, we, we want to quantify it to the best of our ability, even esoteric things. We want to try to quantify them. I like what you said. What your customer tells you is the value, yes. not what you tell them is the value. Yes. You know, there's a thin slice right there. So that, well said. And those two, so the, those first two are profound because if those two are green, then you have a, you've got a zebra. Now it's just a matter of time before mm -hmm. they realize it and or you can convince them that your solution is a fit. Mm -hmm. So th that, 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 that helps you with your uh, business development. That helps you with your marketing. That helps you with, with your marketing automation that you put in place. Because if you only go after prospects where the first two attributes, company and operations, are green, mm -hmm. then you're, you're already starting to hone in on where you bring exceptional value and where your win rate will, will start to go up. And I love the fact that you tied in the, the, the I'll call it the cost of sales, right? Because right. once you know what you're going after, as you say, you become more efficient with your marketing, you know, your business development team is more focused. They can go out there, hunt and give more, I guess, marching instructions to their salespeople. That's right. And everybody understands the customer they serve that way and the problem they solve. And, and most companies can't answer those two questions. Interesting. That is interesting. So now let, let's move past the book. Again, get selling to zebras. Just get the book. Just get the book. Um, but I want to talk about your new venture. Talk to me about this. Is this, can I call it the softwarefication 
Oh, selling to zebras. I'm gonna call it the softwareification. I made that word up. Okay. I, I might, I might steal that. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours, man. <laughs> so we just talked about um, the zebra itself. So the other, the other five attributes of it, and then I'll. So this will roll into what the question you just asked. So next is power. So you make sure you fit, and then it's worth it to try to figure out who is the decision maker. That's the person we call power. Next is funding. No, no process will be complete without that, but funding or budget. Then fifth is, is ROI slash value. What quantifiable value would you create for that client if they, if they bought from you? Sixth is technology. What technology do you bring that, that creates this differentiation for you? And everybody has technology in their solution today. I don't care what type of company you are. I mean, even a dirt mover, you know, yeah. they use GPS in their trucks, got, right? Hey, you got a phone, you got technology. Exactly. Yeah. And then last is service. So service isn't, do you provide good service? What service is, is what level of service do I have to provide to make sure my, my product, my cut now customer actually achieves the value, solves the business problem and achieves the value that we agreed they, they needed it and wanted. So when you go through the process of creating that, it's unless you have some guidance, most people don't do it right. Even after reading the book and all the secret sauce is in the book, you know, we were told that long ago, you're different than most, you know, you don't put all, you put all the secret sauce in there. We did. I put everything I knew in that book. <laughs> I believe you, man. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> so, but now what we've done is with the zebrification of the book, we turned it into software and we just added a new product that we're going to offer to your listeners for free, by the way. Oh, I love that. Okay, hold that thought. Hold that thought. Because I got hold that thought now. By the way, great sales guy. You see how he tees you up? Love it. So the one of the things that's in that process that's so subtle, that's so subtle that you got to really like pay attention is that you're actually also telling, uh, I'll call it, it's either a story or you're developing a narrative as you're going through that process. And that's the story you're telling the customer, right? This mm -hmm. is how it's gonna help you. Talk to me a little bit about that as you're going through the process of, you know, especially the quantifying, you know, the changes of culture, technology and all that, you know, what, are, you know, what's your, you know, just talk about storyline, I guess, in this case. Well, you, what, uh, what we teach is you can actually sit down with a prospect and you can tell them why you're there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I know where I fit really well. We call that a zebra. And I think you might be one, but what, what I think doesn't really matter. I did my homework. I did my research. And I think you have the business problem I solve. Um, and I found evidence of that. But what I don't know is, is that important to you today to solve it? Is it, is it a priority? So you can have a dialogue that gets confirmation that you fit. It makes it more collaborative. And you get agreement then to go to the next step which is to, you know, I, I know how to quantify the value of solving these problems. Would you be interested in that as a next meeting? So it's a logical flow to, I'm in the right place. They agree. Now you say, okay, I can build a business case around this. You know, would you like to participate in that? So it's, mm -hmm. it's a logical flow that proves that you can solve their problem. And then with that customer proof we talked about before, mm -hmm. you could, you've got others that have done it. And that creates comfort that creates confidence and that that then creates the ability to create not just a, a, a relationship with a customer, a new customer, but also stickiness because many of the customers there are customers sell a SaaS solution or they sell something else that's maybe easy to turn on, but it's also easy to turn off. So you want to make sure that there's a strong fit that will last for years. I love that. I love that. And, and there's something implicit, you know, in, in, in your product and your process. If you think about it, the, the zebrafication piece is really like a marketing piece, right? If you think mm -hmm. about it, because it you've got to find and market to your ideal prospect tied in with your sales. Flow. I, I think that's what indirectly a, attracted me because it was like a merger of two marketing and sales in one process. You know who you market to. Once we know who to market to, now we just got to sell them and close them on the value proposition. And I've always also, loved that. And also product development. So it pulls them in too, because now you're more tightly integrated with the problem you solve. And how do we do an even better job of solving that problem? What do we do well today? But what could we enhance that would make it so that we can even do a better job of solving problems for them? So, so if I'm a skeptic, let's say I'm a cynic right now, right? Be cynical right now. I'm going cynical on you, okay, Jeff? Be ready for okay. this, okay? 
I said, I don't know, Jeff, this sounds like a lengthy process that, you know, I'm going to invest a lot of time in and uh, I, I'm just not going to see the return on investment. It sounds like too much for my salespeople to do. You know, you probably heard these stories before, right? These pushbacks, you know, yeah. this seems like a love involved process. I don't know. I mean, convince me, sell me, man, sell me <laughs> on why this does work. Well, it, it, it does work, but we've made it even easier. So a lot of times, even a good sales guy doesn't know he's got a zebra when he's got one. He just, he can't, he knows it. He knows it in his gut. A lot of guys know it, they, but they can't tell you why they can't. And they can't teach it for that reason. Right. Well, what we did was we now applied AI and machine learning to this and inside of Salesforce, we literally just put a button and you go to a opportunity. That's a great customer. You just click on our find similars button. And it goes and it will find up to five that look and feel just like that one. Yeah. So now you don't have to have the whole zebra even figured out because we've in essence figured it out for you with software. Yeah. So you've, you've essentially, by the way, we're going to take a step back and just walk through the AI piece, but you, you've literally taken zebrafication and turned it into this algorithm of similars, right? That's right. And and that's what you're looking for. So take a step back for the folks who are th looking at this. I mean, this is more, is it, is, it, is it right to say that this is really more of a B2B application? It's totally, it's totally B2B. Okay. Just want to be sure. And yep. so if, if I'm going to get started and because, you know, and walk me through the basics of the data slash machine learning, just kind of give me the ABCs. And what, if I wanted to implement this, what's that going to cost me? Not in terms of dollars, but in resources, effort, what do I need to do? So it's, it's even to just get started and, and, and we're giving away, you know, right now in this, in this, in this time and what we've all been through, um, we have to bring something of value to customers that doesn't necessarily bring value to us. I, mm -hmm. I think that's how we're going to have to penetrate and get people interested, get them to raise their hand. So mm -hmm. we decided to make this free and it, it, the, the amount of work uh, is, is, almost negligible because there's a very little code that goes into Salesforce. It's just a button that appears on an opportunity mm -hmm. and everything else is happening behind the scenes inside of our platform. We've ingested and, and, and scraped the web looking for what we know we need to, to answer the question about fine similars. We've, we've ingested million plus companies mm -hmm. and we're continuing to refine that and continuing to scrape that. So we've created this big database for B2B customers. Again, we started with Salesforce, so that's where the beta version works. But we're mm -hmm. giving that away for free, and you can literally start every sales cycle with confidence knowing that you're pursuing somebody that's, that's as close a fit as an existing customer that you're already doing business with. Got it. So, so for this software, who's your zebra? If uh, your ideal client in this case is, if, if I have a CRM, mm -hmm. and if it's Salesforce, Zoho, well, maybe. It has to, has to be Salesforce at first because that's where we're starting from. Okay. So for now, your zebra is Salesforce users. Correct. Right? And then I love the fact that I want people to get this, that you're ingesting data, scraping the web for information. Are you actually doing any type of like, you know, the social media? Are you pulling any of that stuff in? We, we, if it's available, yes. Okay. We pull that in. Um, we don't yet identify who power is, but that's, that's something we're going to bring in the future. Sure. So not only will we tell you who to, which accounts to go after, we'll tell you who in the account to go after. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, this, is this is just the beginning. Sure. And can, can you explain, because I want to make sure I'm clear. I, I, when you say we haven't been able to pull in power yet, because you can identify like decision makers, but that's not what you're referring to, is it? No, we want to find, so who did it, who, who is the person that was actually there to sign off within your existing gotcha. customer base? What level did that take? You know, what are some of the, some of the titles maybe? What are some of the functions that they fill? Um, what are the, uh, going back to the business problems you solve, who, who owns that problem? Whose pain is that? So our goal is to figure out who owns that in each company, because that's not necessarily a title. It can be different from company to company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we call the person power to begin with, because it's whoever, our, our simple definition of, of power is the person who can buy from you, even without a budget, if you bring them a business case that makes sense. I love that definition. I've never heard anybody slice that one like that. 
that's why I, I was kind of confused. I said, I know you can pull decision makers, but that's not what you're saying. Right. You're saying who's behind the curtain and we need to identify who's behind the curtain. And so, yeah, that's powerful, man. That's, if you can pull that, that's a lot of data and that's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people to bring in because I, I think the last study I read and correct me if I'm wrong, cause I could be, is that on average in a B2B sales, there's now involved like almost nine decision makers in just making a buying decision. You know, I don't know what the number is. Some say six, some say eight, some say nine, you know, talk to, talk to me a little bit about that and how this software can help you with that. So our, in our process, in, in any good process, it, the magic isn't in our process. The magic actually is in our software. Any good process will work. Right. Um, but there, what any decision, what any person in a position of power is going to do is make sure that their people will, will use it, make sure it, they're going to adopt, make mm -hmm. sure that they're really going to solve the business problem. And that's why so many more people are involved in the decision. Mm -hmm. Those people aren't decision makers, though. Those people are decision influencers. Correct. Right. You have to address them. And, and, and I go all the way back to what strategic selling said 40 years ago, you know, you know, Miller great Hyman, book, Molly, great book, still it, a great book. It is still a great book. You know, Miller Hyman taught us yeah. that there's going to be a technical buyer. You know, there is somebody that really wants this, that you can turn into a coach and there's a, a an economic buyer. That's the person right. we, we call power. Right. Right. And you can, and you have to satisfy all of those different constituencies. Right. Um, their process works with our software because it's it's a good process. Power based yeah. selling, same thing. Um, yeah. Customer selling, another good book. Another thing. good book. Yeah. Yeah, another yeah. good book. It's a great book. <laughs> we read the same books. Oh, I, yeah. you know, I, keep, I keep telling people there's so much. To me, I think Mac Hannon's Cultural State of Selling is still the, that's the top. You know, I got a shelf yeah. of books. It's at the top. Yeah, it, that's another great one. And hope I is, think hope it, is not a strategy. I mean, there's <laughs> that was Rick. I forgot his last name, but I know he passed Taft. away a few years. Rick Taft. Yeah, 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 good guy. Uh, but but I, I love that. I, one of the uh, new decision makers I've discovered in the B2B technical buying side are lawyers because of cybersecurity and data. Oh, okay, interesting. So I thought yeah. that, that was an interesting one, right? But So can you give me something that you can share or you can be general about it. You can anonymize the data, so to speak, right? And that is, do you have an example of a company who – you know, you worked with and, you know, they identified that power and it wasn't what they expected or some aha moment that you have. So the biggest aha moments that we see coming out of what we do is when we, we do voice, we call it voice of the customer work. So we, our, our customers, when we first started, start working with them, they really don't know why companies buy from them. Mm -hmm. They don't, they can't articulate the business problem they solve. Even if you ask executives, what business problem do you solve for your customer? They invariably start talking about their product. Is, by the way, I, I want to pause you there because it's, that thing is, that statement is so simple, but so obvious that most people just step right over it. Is that well, why are people buying from you? Oh, uh, because we have great product. I don't think so. I think it's deeper than that. It is deeper than that. So we, we talk with, our customers customers and we figure out why did they buy what problem did it solve what value was created and sometimes the prospect doesn't know sometimes you actually have to educate the prospect or, or sorry the customer that you're talking to on the value they receive mm -hmm. they actually give you numbers and they give you data but they never put it together as to why that was a powerful ROI yeah it's and, almost like they can't connect value sometimes it's really fascinating because you think they understood the value when they bought it Yes. And then when you explain those and you realize you can, you're also getting this, they go, no, I didn't think about that. Well, and also the relationship that we have with our customers often isn't with the, the person who's in a position of power because mm -hmm. it settles back into who's the daily user of your solution. That's where our relationship is. So right. we have to go back up to where the person was that originally approved it. That's the person we've got to find out. Why did you approve it? Right. Why did you buy? Because their perspective is different. And that's where the aha moments come from that you were talking about. You know, why did, why did you buy? Well, we talked with, I'll, I'll give you an example. We talked with Airbus for one of our customers. That was, that was their biggest customer at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and we asked Airbus, why did, why did you buy? You know, and, and this customer, they did big data. They, did, they had AI before we even called it AI, right? right. And it was algorithms. It's just, yeah. right? And, and what 
what this client, they were called Vivissimo, and now they're part of IBM, they, they uh, said that it was because of our algorithms. You know, we, we return better search results than anybody else. You know, when you ask a question inside of a company, many companies, big ones like Airbus, mm -hmm. they can't get an answer. Uh, even if they know it's in SAP, they can't even find it. But now they've got all these file shares, like, like in, in those days, you know, it was SharePoint, you know, now they call it something different. Microsoft calls it something different, but those file shares still exist. So there's data in all these silos in all these systems. And the Vismo said, that's, that's why they bought. And Airbus said, you know, they do do that really well. But the reason we bought was because our supply chain is so diverse we had no visibility into our supply chain. We've got this problem. It's called airplane on the ground. We have five people that are assigned virtually to every airplane we've ever put in the air. And our goal is to keep that airplane flying. If there's a problem, we have to figure out how do we get it back up in the air. So we've got to have visibility into our supply chain that can answer the question, when can we get that airplane back in the air? Right. That's why we bought isn't that interesting? Yeah, that is yeah. fascinating, right? You're giving us that, can I use the word insight or is it overused already? That information beyond the obvious, right? I didn't know that. Yes. And those are the aha moments. And they took that right to the boardroom. And literally we found aha moments like that in their other customers. And they started this further developing their products to better answer these specific use case problems that their customers were using their solution for. It was, it was very horizontal solution that they started to become much more focused on. That's with specific use cases. And, and I love that example. And the whole insight piece triggered me to ask you, was there something on, on your site? I think I saw something on your site. If I'm wrong, just tell me I'm wrong about uh, the challenger sale and like spin selling. Did yeah, you have so, something on and By the way, yeah, those are like have, two of my favorite books. I'm, I'm telling you, you can wake me up. Say, I'll say Matt Cannon, spin selling the challenger sale. Yep. You know? So what's going on with that? Well, the challenger sale, we, we've had our clients tell us we're the, we're the challenger sale with tools. <laughs> right. Okay. I love it. I love it. And we, we actually create, our software creates, we call it a hypothesis of value for a prospect. Here's, here's a preliminary business case. That's a hypothesis of value. Right. Well, they actually use that line in their book, the challenger sale. Now who a talks like that? Value. Yeah. Yeah. Normal people don't talk like that. Right. That came from us. Like exactly. Yeah. Go, exactly. Matt Dixon, I want an explanation. Right now, give me, you know, Brent, give me an explanation. Exactly. <laughs> way, for, those, for those who don't know who not read the Challenger Show, which again, I would highly recommend is that they, they came up with five archetypes or five modes salespeople are in. And the most dominant one in many cases for the best salespeople are challengers. Mm -hmm. And I think if I go off memory is that they, they, teach for, they teach for differentiation, tailor for resonance, and they take control of the conversation without being that, a jerk. That, that was excellent. Yeah. And what they do is that, and I think the biggest misnomer or misperception of the book is that relate because the relationship seller did worse in many cases, whether it was up or down economy or simple or complex sale, right. that it isn't about relation. That's not what they said. It's just not one of your dominant modes. And so what right. you're saying is that when you're saying your tool helps them be a challenger, what I love about that is that if you understand what a challenger is, take control, teach, teach for differentiation and tailor for resonance, you can use your data to begin to help that. Is that a decent assessment? It, it, it is. And, and our, our, our software actually, you actually present from our software to a prospect. So we, we call it, nobody's ever heard of this, so it might be confusing. We call it software guided selling. It's kind of like a playbook. Think of playbooks, um, but it's actually live with the prospect. Mm -hmm. So you're collaboratively creating the materials, you're reviewing them, you're verifying them, you're mm -hmm. agreeing on the next step. So in, with software guided selling, you're, you're actually transforming everybody into a challenger salespeople that follows the process. I love that. I had, to, I had to write this down because you just said several great things that I've, I've heard. I got to remember this. I just watched this video. You know, the, the hypothesis of value is actually just a brilliant line. You know what I mean? Because it's like, here's my hypothesis on how we can have value. You're not telling them. I just have a theory. Here's my hypothesis. And I also love this, the software guided selling. You know, because I, I truly believe that that's how you can leverage data. I think that's the, that in the future is going to be the new cyborg salesperson, if I can say it that way, mm -hmm. that anybody that can, you know, just merge themselves as a salesperson, need the sales skills, but then use the technology. You know, I right. think that's kind of what we're looking for. Does that make sense? It, it does. 
it, and it doesn't marginalize the skill set that a great salesperson brings. It, it, it enhances it. So, you know, their, 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 their value doesn't diminish. It actually increases. And, and like you said, you know, with the challenger, they said the relationship guy is the least performing, but like you pointed out, that doesn't mean that you can be a jerk and sell, right? And they even use that line right. in the book. Yeah. It means that you bring your relationship building skills, but you attach them to business reasons why the prospect would care. And that's, that's why they let you in the door. It's not because you bring coffee and donuts. That's right. That's right. I, <laughs> the, the, the other thing I've started to notice, and I, I like your opinion on this, and I'm going to ask you about the future of selling is that I tell people that in today's market, you got to bring the business value first. Mm -hmm. And then from there is when the relationships really form. Because when a company That's knows right. that you can help them, it follows. I 100% agree that it's, in fact, you can't even get in the door if you don't operate that way anymore. Right. When I, I, I don't know who, uh, where the data point came from. Maybe it was CSO inside one of these companies that said 76% of decision makers don't even want to talk to a salesperson before they've gone so far into the decision making process. Yeah, that's why the web is so important, right? So everything you put on in your website, that's why your knowledge, um, your, your, your thought leadership pieces that you put out. Um, and, and we think um, you have to, salespeople have to creatively offer something of value today that doesn't bring any gain to themselves that you know will bring value to that prospect and gets them to raise their hand. Getting back to your point, they don't want 75% of the deal is done before they let you in the door. Well, you've got to give them a reason to raise their hand and then they will engage. So if you bring them something of value that didn't help you, there's, there's, there's hardly any, any better way to start that relationship because they already feel if the, most people are good people. If you bring them value, they want to give you something back. Mm -hmm. The rule of reciprocity kicks in. And you know, the thing is that there is no shortcut to this. I tell salespeople, especially in the B2B space, you know, yeah. you, people want to listen to people who have novel ideas or bring them insight, aha moments, or, you know, shift their paradigms a little bit. If you just That's do the right. basic, yeah, yeah. And you go in there like, hey, are those your kids? Hey, nice boat. I see you like fishing. Come on. I don't have time for this right now. What do you have? And again, I'm not right. saying the relation. I don't want to come off cold here. That the relationship is not important. But I think you, you're, you're putting your finger on is that they want some business value. That's why I love that phrase. It resonates with that hypothesis of value. Because here's what I'm bringing to the table that I think might be a value. I'm not making, you know, a certified statement, say, or a declaration. I'm just throwing it out there. Let's chat about it. And I think that's a great discussion. Right. Yeah. And so, if you, you, you said like, what are the tools of the future? Well, if, if you have a tool that can help you say, look, I, I, I don't waste your time. I don't waste mine. I, I, I target really well. I, I put time into figuring out who needs me and why. And that's, that's why I'm here. Now I just need to get agreement from you that this is something that would be a priority to solve if I showed you something that could solve it. So mm -hmm. it's really then you're, you're, you're already in the right place. Now it's just a matter of timing and you're trying to get them to agree that the timing is right. And if it's not, you shake your dust from your feet. It's biblical here. Yeah. <laughs> and you move <laughs> on to the next town. <laughs> and you move on. Yeah, next town. So, so let's talk about, you know, we, we have machine learning, AI coming into play. You know, one of the questions I've been like ruminating my head about is that, you know, is the salesperson in the future necessary? And I'll zoom in a little bit because that's just too broad. But when I look at the B2B space, and I'll, I'll say, I'll call it the mid-tier market where, you know, the applications is something that maybe most customers can figure out for themselves. You know, where do you see the future of salespeople in terms of playing with technology and, or developing a different type of sales process? Just big question mark. Free range on this one. Go anywhere you want. Well, I think the steps of a good sales process are similar regardless of whose it is. Our, ours isn't that different than anybody else. The only reason we have one is because many companies don't have one. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you bring, a, bring a good process that we say earns you the right to get to power early on to make sure you and they are not wasting their time. And there's no substitute. There's no tool that does that for you. There's no tool... That can that can replace a salesperson. Oh, what happened? You're still there. Oh, 
oh, I know what happened. My screen switched because it was, it was uh, transcribing a Zoom into, you know, I okay. just finished a webinar before, or not an actual, actual educational webinar. So there's no, there's no tool. No <laughs> even, even though you're bringing nuggets, you're bringing pearls to the salesperson with, with what we help them with, you still need somebody that can execute on that. So mm -hmm. Willie Loman isn't dead. <laughs> yeah. He's he'll, still be around. he'll still be around. I, one of the things, you know, I write about, you know, wrote about in the book um, is that when the AI comes into place, it's only going to, it's only those tasks. And I emphasize the word tasks that are going to be AI'd out, right. given to AI. Those steps that are repetitive and, and monotonous that anybody can do, a machine can do. Yeah. But, that don't bring real value. They're, they're just necessary steps. There you go. And I, so I think that's a tougher question when people say, you know, or, or a silly question when people say, will salespeople never ever be needed again? I said, yeah. I mean, and by the way, there will be some markets where the machines will take over. In other words, it's more commoditized products. But we all know that the other end of the spectrum, complexity, you need salespeople, especially some with technical know-how and business acumen. And so on, on, on the software, because I'm really, I want to close out with the software because I'm, I'm excited about your product actually. And, and so, you know, what's the future of this product? So today you're identifying Zebra similars, which I think is brilliant. Just hit a button, look at my deals, look at what I've won. Now go find me, you know, other customers that look just like the Zebra, which almost seems like magic. You know what I mean? And, and so what's the future? What Beyond that step, where do you see this going? So where, where we want to take it is... Um, Next, find who the decision maker, really, who power really is. Mm -hmm. um, create a talk track, automate a talk track that, again, it will take some verve and some business acumen, like you said, to execute on, but it gets the, the salesperson started. And then automate the process of even doing our voice of the customer work so that as you, as you sell, you're, you're, you're gathering, you're doing discovery, you're creating a business case, you're verifying the business case, and verifying the business problems that you know you solve for them. Now, link delivery into that, prove you've solved those problems, verify that they actually did get the value, and that automates the process of creating another voice of the customer proof statement for you. So that'll all be in the software. That, that's, that's where we're gonna take it. That's, that's what we see as our future. That's, that's, that's magic, right? <laughs> but it's amazing because all this data, I think we're not understanding there's so much data out there now. And I think people don't realize that their data really is an asset today. Oh, and it's, it's, it's there. Um, there is data. There isn't information there. Yeah. Right. There isn't insight. Yeah. That's, well, you need, you need the software to convert it into some type of insight, which right. is what you're really talking about. But I, and I think trying to figure out what the voice of the customers, the messages that are out there. And I, I think you, I think you nailed it. I think you found, because I think I've been, I've been looking at similars, the whole algorithms around similars for a while now. So I think you're, you're dead on with your zebra. I mean, this is like a perfect trajectory for you. It's all, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't want to say it's preordained, but you started out with zebras in 2009. And I think the biggest problem we're trying to solve today is finding the zebras yeah. amongst all this data. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's 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 right. You know what's what's the best place for a salesperson to start? I mean, the number one problem, the the number one complaint, salespeople. We, we we deal with salespeople all over the world. The number one complaint that Brian, our we we call him President of Sales. He gave himself that title, by the way. Okay. <laughs> he the number one complaint he hears from salespeople is they don't have enough good leads. And it, so it starts with finding somebody similar to where you've already created exceptional value. So that's, that's the first step we took to, and we've been working on this now for over two years. So it, it wasn't fast. No, no, I believe it. I believe, well, this is an easy stuff. This is not easy. And, no. you know, it would be interesting to see how in the future this becomes, I don't want to use the word commoditized, but you know, but I, I guess I envision one day if I have an app and I'm running everything through my apps, and whatever I need to find, I can hit the zebra button. I'm hoping you make it. A, did you make it a zebra button at least? It should have been a zebra Oh, yeah. It's a, it's just like the logo behind me. Or I guess it's over this shoulder. <laughs> is that it? Is that it? Bam. It so, but hopefully that'll be like, you know, I need to find these type of customers. And in other words, make democratize this type of application and data 
that you can use it in different spaces, which I'm sure is what the future holds. Yeah, we, we believe that because you're inside the software um, and we have the, so much more, we're capturing the data that's really important to the business, we're going to be able to automate all kinds of insights from that. And if salespeople yeah. are conversing through the software live with prospects, we also, as a byproduct, can update the CRM. So we, we automatically update Salesforce so that the salesperson doesn't have to when they're done with that sales call. So interesting. So it is, yeah, feeding back, a nice feedback loop, so to speak. Correct. That is nice. Yeah, I would love to see in the future. My dream for the Zebra would be that I can go to a website, I can pick my market vertical, drill down as, fast, as much as I want, and then hit the magic Zebra button, and little Zebras just pop up with names of customers. That's what I want to see, Jeff. Can you do that for me, man? <laughs> Actually, we have, we have a, a demo that takes about 15 seconds where you go to an opportunity in Salesforce and you, you just say, this is a good one and you click the button and it comes and a little zebra starts running. That means our, <laughs> it's the way it works. And then up to five names pop up that and in the, and the first one is the, the one that correlates the most with that customer. And we give you up to five that are a match. If there's only three out there, um, and, and, it's, and it's just in the U.S. today. So that's, that's another qualifier. So our, the data that we've ingested is just U.S. centric. Um, uh, it'll give you, if there's only three, it'll give you three, for example. Nice. I'm glad you're having some fun with that. On that note, yeah. I'm gonna, such a light note, let's leave it there. Let's leave it. Jeff, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Thank you, Victor.